good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've got a lighter crowd, a crowd than last time. We've got a gentleman who's doing uh, sign language. Does anybody need sign language interpretation? Okay, well, it'll, it'll carry on for a few more minutes, but if you'd like to continue beyond that, just put your hand up and the gentleman will continue. So thank you for coming to our second training taster session. This is the All Aboard training. Those of you who came to the first session earlier, we showed part of the training that's designed to improve the service that we offer to our older and disabled passengers. Back in 2012, um, we realized in conjunction with the GLA that what we were offering as a service to older and disabled people was quite good, but we could, have, we could make it better. So the purpose of this training isn't to put a sticking plaster on something that's very bad. Our Accessibility Mystery Traveller Survey, where independent people go around the network and measure how well we're doing, shows that we are doing quite well. The percentage success is quite high, but we could be better. And that's really the purpose of the film. So we filmed it all uh, in the autumn of 2012. It's currently being shown to all bus drivers. As we speak, about 60% of drivers have had this training, and we're still on course for everybody to have seen it by the end of this year. So what we're about to see is the fourth of the four stories. This is uh, a lady called Tanya, who's a wheelchair user. And what we'll do, we'll actually do the session, my, my colleague's going to do the session as if you're bus drivers who come in for refresher training. So what I'd ask is if you've got any questions, try and save them to the end. But if there is any area that you'd like clarified or you have a burning question, uh, don't be afraid to put up your hand and we'll take it midway. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague and we'll start the, uh, the training. Thank you. Museum. A passenger with his assistance dog. It makes me feel more relaxed if a, a driver recognises Marsh as an assistance dog because um, a lot of the time they don't and that uh, tends to make me a little bit apprehensive um, when I'm boarding a bus. So yeah, it's good when they recognise it. I believe that bus drivers are in the people business and so therefore they should get more involved with people rather than being isolated. Wheelchair users and the buggy users competing in the same space which is really quite constricted this does lead to a certain amount of conflict or difficult situation that people are left to resolve on their own and it would be helpful if the drivers could intervene and actually help us to sort that out and not leave it to us they should proactively and actively be telling passengers right be it mothers with buggies or whatever to fold up their buggies during busy times or to get people to move Tanya's home. I'm Tanya. I'm a would-be actor and I love this city. I'm a busy person with places to go, people to meet and auditions to make. And I love London buses. They give me freedom and independence. No, do you think I would let you take my son? Andy, I think we should be going. Time to break a leg. Tanya's in her wheelchair at a bus stop. She's with her carer. She looks at her watch anxiously. The bus finally arrives. The front doors of the bus open to let passengers on. Has the driver seen Tanya? So, I wonder, have I got that invisibility cloak on today? There's a buggy in the wheelchair space. Oh no, push chair alert. Cringe time coming up. Pause for discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eddie and I work for a company called Metroline Travel Bus Limited. Mm. And um, obviously you've seen the video that has been played regarding Tanya. What we saw there is Tanya trying or attempting to use a bus in London. But uh, you heard her comment from when the bus pulled up and she felt a seat 
the bus driver didn't see her standing at the bus stop. Now then, she made a comment, she said, I wonder if I'm wearing that invisibility cloak. Now, if I may ask, how do you think Tanya is feeling at this moment? Would anybody be volunteering to say or tell me how Tanya is feeling right now? She's feeling vulnerable. Anxious. Anxious. She's feeling vulnerable. Another one? Frustrated. Frustrated. Awkward. <laughs> and awkward. Now, tell me something. If and when you decide to use a badge each day, do you have to feel this way? The answer is no. Do you have to come out to feel as if you're not wanted? The answer is no. Do you have to feel as if when you are attempting to get on a bus, it's a problem to a bus driver? The answer is no. So, what we need to understand is that the way the driver did this particular scenario wasn't the way he was trying to do it. So, what we're going to have a look at next on there is the second part of this scenario and let's see what happened to Tanya. Tanya thinks push chair alert. She imagines what might happen next. Knowing the wheelchair space is occupied, the driver chooses to ignore Tanya. Whatever you do, don't make eye contact. I just do not need to hassle with that mum. Hello, can I have the ramp, please? Hello, can I have the ramp? I've got an audition to go to. Can I have the ramp, please? Don't do this to me. I don't need stress, not today. What would you do? Pause for discussion. Thank you very much. Remember what Tanya said, uh, I don't need this stress today. Why is it that Tanya said she doesn't need stress today? Would you be kind enough to tell me why? She's got audition to go to. Fantastic, she's got an audition to go to. Therefore, she needs to be relaxed in order to audition and then to, part, uh, to get part that she wanted so desperately. Number two. Why is it that the driver ignore Tanya? Perhaps uh, I'm not too sure about Metroline, but uh, some companies put more pressure on other uh, on their drivers to keep on time. So it's either they don't want to hassle or just don't lose time. Okay, can I have one more? She appears to be at the um, rear door where the um, ramp deploys. Okay, now let me tell you something. In our company, all the drivers are trained, we've all shown the correct procedure as to how to load the wheelchair user on buses. Therefore, we in Metro Line have heard to the Big Red Book. We make sure they go through training. A uh, number of days in training so that they understand how to load up the wheelchair. Also, across Metro Line, all the garages we have what we call the wheelchair exercise. Therefore, each and every driver goes through that in order to feel or to know what it feels like to be in a wheelchair before the end of their training. Therefore, they know exactly what to do when they're approaching the bus stop and there's a wheelchair user waiting at the bus stop. Now, let me put this across. When a uh, driver appro approaches the bus stop, we at Metro One show them first and foremost to acknowledge the wheelchair user. So there is not or any point in time where a driver will say they did not see the wheelchair user or therefore the wheelchair user was at the exit door therefore they are not on site. However, if they were at the exit door they still have the button which is the wheelchair button to push to alert the driver of the assistance. 
So there's never a time where these issues will actually crop up. So here we go. We at Mental Mind make sure these situations don't happen. Now, one more thing I need to add. Mental Mind makes sure that every year we bring drivers over to CPC. And CPC, that is incorporated in CPC as well as BTEC training. So they have ample knowledge as to how to load up a wheelchair user. Okay. What CPC stands for, for those who haven't got the knowledge of it, is what we call Certificate of Professional Competency. This was introduced by the government and is it what we call periodic training for drivers of PCB vehicle. Now, this is a training of 30, uh, 35 hours over a period of five years. So therefore, what we do is that we bring drivers to our training center one day every year for seven hours so that they can accumulate their periodic training of various subjects to attain their CPC qualification, which is issued by the DSA, which is the Driving Standard Agency, to drivers in order to show that they've actually gone through training to qualify for CPC training. Now, BTEC. BTEC was introduced by TFL to all London buses, which is similar to when you go to college and you attend BTEC. So this is an on-the-job kind of training. So we have a two-day classroom for BTEC, and then we have on-road assessment for all drivers in our company, and they have to qualify or they have to pass a drive assessment in order to attain BTEC qualification. Um, and the qualification is not a part-time qualification, it's a full qualification that lasts forever. But what we tend to do, we tend to bring them in and bring them every year and what we do is renew or um, retrain them exactly what they've learned already or give them more ideas or in short embed knowledge into the drivers so that they can do a better job. Thank you. So now, the next scenario that we're going to see is how exactly uh, the driver did the loading of Tanya. Back to real life. The bus pulls up as before. The driver spots Tanya and then realizes the wheelchair space is occupied. He uses the IBUS announcement. The wheelchair area is now required. Can passengers please clear this space? Thank you. The mum doesn't move. Could the person with the buggy please make way for the wheelchair user? Once we have her on board, I'm sure we can reposition or even share the space. Thank you. The mum moves out of the way. Ramp comes out and time your boards. Thank you. Once time is in place, the pram repositions and the mum sits down. Thumbs up from the driver, smiles all round. The bus moves off. Well, that was all a bit straightforward. Diplomacy all round. <laughs> you should be working for the United Nations. At the London Transport Museum to hear from the bus users. I think it's fantastic the freedom that I get from the buses and that's down in the end to the bus drivers who are managing the whole service and I think they're doing a terrific job. So you can't thank the driver like you used to be able to in the old days. And back to our drivers. Basically, being a, 
a, a good driver is about paying attention to people's needs. Always keep calm, be professional, always deal with your passengers as if they would be your parents or your grandparents. Put yourself in a passenger's shoes, understand their needs and frustrations and give them the respect that they deserve. Be polite, be calm with people and be professional and just be aware that everybody who uses the bus has different needs. My advice would be talk to the people so you can meet their needs. Be calm, uh, listen, give them some time, uh, with respect as a member of your family. If our passengers are unhappy, what's the point of us? how important you are to the lives of so many people. Have the confidence to talk to your customers and if in doubt, ask them how you can help. Here are a few closing thoughts about what they really value about you. Courtesy. A smile. Empathy. Interacting. Reliability. Inclusive. Compassion. Friendliness. A nod or a smile of recognition. I hope you've got something from watching this film and from talking to your colleagues. You know, you should be really proud of the job you do and the role you play. For many older and disabled customers, you're a lifeline. You give them the freedom and independence to enjoy this great city of ours. You have the power to ensure the iconic Red London bus really does mean all aboard. We thank you. Produced by Gilby Films, with thanks to the staff at Abellio and Metroline. In conclusion, I'd like to reassure everybody that in Metroline, we make sure that our drivers do the right thing, make sure our customers are welcome on our bus, that they feel that they are part of this um, entire establishment so that they don't feel like a seat when they get on our buses, they are not wanted. So please feel free to use our buses because our, our drivers are trained properly to do the, um, all the procedure and all the stuff that we were asked to do. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Did um, anybody have any questions? Yes, so come over to you and give the microphone. Uh, looking at the second scenario, it's slightly different because you didn't have the queue of passengers waiting to get on. And I think if I... Apologise to will you, but if I was in that situation, I think if the door at the front opened first and the passengers were getting on, I'd still feel a little bit worried, like, is the driver just going to shut the door and drive off? I think if the ramp came down, and the door opened before the front door opened so that I had time to get on and then they got on. It would just feel a little bit more, I feel a bit more comfortable with it. No, thank, thank you for that. I mean, just to, just to clarify, certainly in the Big Red Book, we outline exactly as, as you've said, that if there is a wheelchair user at the stop, um, you open the, well, you let the people off, you shut the back doors, you deploy the ramp, and then you open the back doors before anybody else gets on. That's, that's the clear procedure. What would the operators would do, like my colleague from Metroline and the uh, young lady from Stagecoach who gave the first presentation, would do as part of this, go back to that section in the Big Red Book to remind drivers of that exact hierarchy. And, and I take your point, I mean, it, it's quite a contrived scenario, I accept that. The point about the, the message there is really the process, that regardless of whether there's a few people or a lot of people on the bus, or whether there's three people boarding or 30 people boarding, it should be the case that the driver looks back, if that space is occupied, plays the message instinctively, 
if that person doesn't move, they've got the public address system to add to that message. So that's that's the main message there for drivers to take away. And the added bit is, as you rightly say, that to reinforce the position of you let the wheelchair user on first, and then you let everybody else on after. It's, it's a bit like the big rocks principle that. It's easier to let the wheelchair user on first and everybody flow around that person than the other way around uh, because then people will stand in the, in the space. But thank you, that's a very good point. Thank you very much. Any, any other points anybody would like to raise? Okay. Um, I, I mean, the, the final point I just wanted to say, for those of you who um, were in the se uh, session over the way when we had the MDs discussion, uh, and with Mike Weston present as well, a lot of people talked about empathy, and you may have noticed that within that closing section, that's exactly what one of the participants said that they liked from drivers. And the other added bit um, was, of course, drivers themselves were telling other drivers who'd be watching this film, think about it could be your parents or your grandparents or a member of your own family. So I hope you see that it's not just about lip service. We're actively saying to drivers and other staff, show empathy. How would you like to be treated if you were in that situation? Um, so it's been a pleasure to run the Taster sessions. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. Uh, we've got a question at the back, so I'll just hear that. So the question is, uh, an able-bodied mother can cause the driver more abbreviation than the person in wheelchair stranded on pavement. Most of my problems are caused by poor bus design rather rather than by badly no, by bad by bad drivers okay thank you thank you very much the uh, there's two sections there the, the first section I'll cover off, I, I totally agree. Some, some not that I see mothers, but guardians of children, whoever's looking after the buggy, can be quite vociferous. And again, that's why we deliberately set up our scenario as we did, in that the person didn't move instinctively when the PA, uh, sorry, when the automatic announcement was made, and the driver then gave that additional information to explain to the passenger you can both share the space and you've really got to move. And that's, that's the message, that the driver has to do as much as he or she can do because some people won't move of their own volition. And that's something we're enforcing with the training, we're continuing to enforce with our training and, and we'll keep doing that. Um, so hopefully that, that came out of, of the video. The second aspect, very, very quickly, it does a bus design. As you know, we've got our new route master, and that particular bus, we, as TFL, have had full say about how it's designed, how it's laid out, in terms of the seating, the wheelchair spacing, the iBus, uh, positioning of the iBus screens, that's totally within our control. With other types of bus, we're very limited in, in what we can get because they're off-the-shelf products. So the bus that's behind us as, as I speak, the double-decker, that's a standard uh, model double-decker from a company called Wrights in Ballymena, Northern Ireland. And it's, it's a basic product. Now, we try and refine it as much as we can 
but it's basically a rights product. Now, as time goes on, the designs do get better. And, and one of the aspects of rights buses is that using the influence of the new route master, the newer standard double decks on other routes actually include a lot of features from the new route master. So I totally understand where you're coming from. In terms of design, it's not perfect. And as I mentioned, you know, it, it's an okay situation that we want to get better. So in terms of the training, in terms of the design, we've seen things improve. And one of the things about the rights products is that you can see the newer standard double-deckers have got a clear influence from our new route master, which we, we've done from scratch for London. So thank you very much. They're, they're good questions. Thank you, sir. Do, um, do uh, wheelchair complaints from uh, two bus companies? Oops, sorry. Do uh, bus. Tell you what, I'll just ask you. <laughs> I'll shout. Um, do bus uh, 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 complaints from bus uh, from wheelchair users to bus companies? Does that reflect, reflect on their new on their on their new uh, fr you know re letting of a route? If, if I, yeah, great yeah. question. And the gentleman uh, just in the front here was just saying, do complaints actually pay a part in the retendering of a route? That's it. And I can confirm that customer service is now a major, major part of a retendering of a route. But most of you may know, some of you may not. The routes um, that are TFL London routes are operated on our behalf by private companies, be it Metroline, Stagecoach and other major operators. The standard contract is for five years and if that operator provides a very, very good service, it's extended for two years. And one of the benchmarks is indeed customer service. I, I mentioned it at the earlier survey, I think I mentioned it at the beginning of this one uh, session, is we've got accessibility mystery traveller survey. So we've got independent people, older and disabled people, actually travelling on the buses uh, covertly, measuring how the driver's doing. So again, those scores are broken down into operators and we'll use that as our benchmark. So I can assure you that certainly um, the gentleman uh, mentioned in, in the Q&A session across the way, do we compile um, compliments and uh, letters that praise drivers? We do. So if you've had a good experience, tell us. If you've had a bad experience, tell us. That's very, very important because if you've had a good experience, you can imagine what an uplifting effect that has to that particular driver and encourages other drivers who may be not as good as him or her to provide a better service. So I, I thoroughly um, put that to all of you and suggest if you've had a good experience, tell us if you write in, tweet, email, whatever's easier for you, because that driver will feel really, really happy that somebody noticed, how, and he or she will then tell their colleagues, and that's how we can promote more and more good service. But the more you tell us, good or bad, the more we can then give that back to the company and then determine whether it's a good service or a bad service. So would, thank you very much. Would you go to... Just a final one. Would you go down the uh, TripAdvisor route of of, uh, of complaints and, and praise? You know, so people can see how good they're doing. You know, like uh, TripAdvisor. Do, um, some of it, some of it is is on the uh, website. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the gentleman just asked. Sorry. sorry. You get a bit of feedback. And the gentleman just asked, would we go down the TripAdvisor route? So, so it was in the public domain. We, we don't put granular information. We, we put overall information um, on in the yearly report, which is on the TFL website. But if you wanted to know any particular detail about routes or companies, you're able to do that um, because we're a government body. You can basically ask for that information, and we'll gladly provide it. So thank you. But the lady at the front had a question. No, 
Okay. I mean, certainly, um, we, we'll, I'll say a little bit about it. I'm, I'm not involved in the in the bus design, and it may be something you might want to put on the post-its uh, before you go. With the new route master, it's a hybrid bus, um, and we had to keep weight to a minimum. And the design of the bus is such that it uses a lot of glass. Now, if you have copper windows in that design, first of all, it adds to the weight, but also it compromises the strength of the glass, which is quite integral to that design. I do understand we've had a few issues in, in the warmer days and weeks. It's something that's been uh, addressed by the engineering people. The air cooling, when it works, is, is very, very effective. <laughs> Basically what it does is it sucks in the air at the front, it takes it through um, a, a bit of apparatus that cools it down, and then pushes it through the bus and then out the back. Um, so when it works, it, it's very, very effective, but it does keep the weight down because it's not an air conditioning pod, which would weigh a lot of my but it would be quite heavy, and it's not a um, helper window. So when it works, it works very, very well. But I do understand we've had a few issues on warm days. It's only been in service two, three years now, and I think in fairness, on the whole, it's been good, but you're quite right. We've had days when it's been very, very hot, and it has been like a greenhouse, and we apologise for that. But I think with any new bus, it's going to have teething problems, and each year the situation does get better and more and more come into service. Certainly the newer ones that we've got on routes 8 and 38 are an adapted design compared to the earlier ones we've had on Route 24. And then once we go um, into the coming months, when new route masters will be available, a lot of the early ones will go for, to be rectified and have those extra features fitted to make the air cooling um, more viable. So thank you. Can be. Hi, um, my question again doesn't relate to um, customer awareness training, it's about uh, accessible bus stops and I know that TFL are doing a lot to kind of improve the accessibility bus stops in the coming years. Um, do you have a sort of dialogue with bus drivers so that they can also report um, when there are some bus routes that aren't necessarily, or bus stops that aren't necessarily accessible and how would you get um, customers to feed back that information in an easy way? That's a very good question, actually. Um, certainly, the bus operators are aware of the latest status of the accessible, of the accessible <laughs> stops. Um, I must get away from this equipment speaking back. In terms of drivers being aware of stops, they're, they're told if any particular stops are closed or if there's an issue at particular stops through what we call a notice of event, so they'd be aware of that. Certainly at a company level, we pass that information on. If, I mean, the only, the only way we can know whether it's actually reached drivers or whether it's been effective is through people like the Good Self. That if, for example, on a particular route, you know a stop has been closed or, or drivers aren't serving it properly, that your good feedback will enable us to, to make the situation better. Or if there's a particular stop, and you think, well, hang on, didn't, didn't TFL say this should be an accessible stop within the next 12 months? It hasn't been. Then again, your good feedback will allow us to take that up with the council. So for me, it's all about, I mean, it was basically my job, it's all about communication and making sure that if, if you feel something's not right, don't be afraid to tell us. And, and I think that's, that's what I said earlier to all of you. We rely on good feedback, so if you feel something's not right, or people should know about a particular situation, be it that a stop should be accessible, it's been rebuilt, so drivers should serve it properly, or for example, for some reason it's been closed, but that information hasn't been made available to you, then let us know, definitely. Thank you.
have a shit report today. Um, my experience is that they are reluctant and um, I know you're going to say um, communicate with you but I have a fatigue. Uh, they send in running numbers and group numbers and times and very little is done. I, I can assure you, um, with, with ramps, the, the position is this, it's a contractual requirement. It's not a nice to have, it, it's a mandatory thing. Companies, in order to meet their contractual requirement, have to test the ramp each, each day. They have to do that. Now the point is, again, I, I would say to you, and, and you've done that, to, to let us know. Now when you let us know, we can check the records because every time that ramp is deployed, it will register on that bus's databank, whether it's been deployed or not. So if you write in and say a bus on a particular route um, had a defective ramp, we would check to see whether it was tested that morning before it left the garage, because it'd be in the databank. Now it might be, it worked when it left the garage, it was tested and it worked fine. When during the day, one of three things could happen. It could be that it gets some grit in the ramp. It's an electronic piece of equipment. Unfortunately, if grit gets into it, then it might fail. It could be the camber of the road. And again, one of the stories we didn't play today, um, but the second story is all about if you can't deploy the ramp at the stop, there's nothing to stop the driver just driving a little bit further down the road and trying to deploy the ramp there. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it actually loosens the grip as well. You try it a second time. Well, the third thing, because it's an electronic piece of equipment, it might just fail. So the point being, we will look to see if it was tested. Now, if it wasn't tested that particular morning, the company will be fine. It's as simple as that. So the point is, if we're made aware, and as I mentioned, we've got accessibility mystery traveller surveyors going out, checking for ramps as well. We've got um, surveyors who are wheelchair users. If they find a particular ramp isn't working, we get that data bank and we check if that ramp was tested in the morning. Again, if we find it wasn't tested, the operator's fine. There's certainly a lot of fines out there, I can assure you of that, a lot of companies have been fined for various things, including defective wheelchair ramps. So we do find them. Going back to an earlier point, or a point made by one of the colleagues, in terms of awarding the contracts, again, that counts towards customer service and meeting the contractual requirement. So if you're continually operating buses that have got defective ramps, you're then in breach of the contract. And you might be that you don't get that contract back. Now, we haven't reached that stage yet, but if it was the case that a particular operator had continuously defective ramps, it could be they don't get that contract back. Simple as that. So it is a contractual requirement. It is a, a mandatory test that needs to be made. We do random checks ourselves. We've got the accessibility mystery travellers who will do checks every quarter over a period of time. And we've then got people like Good Self with feedback information telling us about a ramp that might not work. So using those three bits of information, we will look to see what's going on. As I say, if people aren't doing what they're told, that's a breach of the contract. So thank you. I just want to say, like, some, from my experience, I found like some bus companies or bus drivers are better trained on disability than the others at me. Because I found like I've had better experience from some bus um, companies than the other. And my suggestion: why, why can it? Why can the disability training be universal to all, you know, just be the same thing that they are trained, you know, the same, uh, you know, get the same training all across rather than having all these inconsistencies, like you get one bus driver, I mean, some bus drivers from some bus companies, you know, with really good customer service, while well, the other ones are lacking in it, you know? 
Okay. I mean, certainly what you've seen today is, is the standard product. The, the, the two bits we've shown you from all aboard training is being given to all trainers and being delivered to all bus drivers. So we've given clear instructions of what we want from the trainers and how they should present that to drivers. And equally, all drivers, by the end of this year, will have seen the film. As I mentioned, uh, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but what I mentioned was 60% of our drivers have seen the film. Now it might be, that could be 40% from one operator and 70% from another operator. So we may have that inconsistency at the moment because we're in the middle of the training. But once we get to January, we will then be in a position to say all 24,500 drivers have seen this training. And the point is, again, it's, it's mandatory. There's not a choice. All drivers have to see it. All companies have to prove that the drivers have seen this as part of the Certificate of Parental Competence training that my colleague mentioned earlier. And the benchmark is that is what they've seen and that's what we expect. So again, any complaints that come in, we can immediately say drivers haven't been done as they drivers aren't doing what they've been shown, what they've been told. So maybe you've got that inconsistency now because some drivers have seen it, some drivers haven't. But by the beginning of 2015, all of the drivers would have seen exactly that same message delivered in exactly the same way. So thank you. And I think the lady, did the lady at the back have a question? to deal with. Now the point with that 
is we can't tell you exactly what's happened because of data protection. Now, a lot of people say they want to know, you know, was the driver sacked? Did he get told off? You know, certainly, he or she will certainly get told off, I guarantee that. And the point is, there'll be a note made on their staff record. So, as a result of what happened to you, that's quite serious. You know, there's no, no getting away from that. And once the driver was called in, there would be an appropriate note on their record. And they'd be told in no uncertain terms, if they do that again, it would escalate uh, to a more serious position. So, I'm really sorry that happened. The other point I was going to make as part of this training, we would again re-emphasise the point uh, and what you didn't see is the fact that um, a picture would appear as part of the supplementary training showing the bell and reminding drivers that when the wheelchair button is pressed, this is what they see and therefore if there's a wheelchair user on the bus, it's quite likely that wheelchair user wants to leave the bus at that stop. So the point is, it's not perfect, it's good, but I totally understand we could be better and we've got room for manoeuvre and I'm hoping that as a result of the training you've seen, things will get better. And if, it, if things do still go wrong, we've got measures in place and the operators are well aware of that, that we will be looking at them with a fine uh, well, microscope effectively. And that's, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a good point. You can't stop non-wheelchair users from pressing the bell, because it's a bell. And the thing is, you tend to find, because it's low down, children love to press it, because it's at their height. And so the point is, there's no way of stopping that. However, again, as a driver, if I was in that situation and I wasn't sure, I can still call back and say, uh, excuse me, madam, is this the stop you wanted? And then you could say yes or no. And, and I think, again, that's part of the training. We, we cover that. You know, it's all about, as I mentioned before, it's all about clear communication. It's, it's getting that point across. <laughs> No, and of course, of course, it's not your fault. It's, yeah, I understand that. I, I think that the point is, I think for now, we, we're getting those points back to drive. It's not your fault. Of course, it's not your fault. The point is, we're getting those points across as part of our training. Let's see how things go from here. I, I really sincerely hope you don't have a repeat of that. I really honestly don't. Um, but hopefully things will get better. Yeah, just to echo that, the bell. I think sometimes see the position, the location where the bell is sometimes, yeah. like uh, when it's on you, like there's a post right of the bus yeah. there and it's quite low there so people tend to lean on it yeah. when they're standing so it keeps raining or I mean it's just like a quick access for people coming from up from the upper deck they just press on it so if you will be on some buses on the where the window is I find like it most likely if you're a wheelchair user you'll be there so it is easy read and it will not, it, it will most not, it will most likely not be used by other people when it's on the right where the window is, yeah. rather than yeah. at well, the cross. Well, I mean, the, yeah. yeah I, I don't disagree, I don't disagree at all. The thing is, there's no ideal place for it because everybody is, is different. Some people um, have more dexterity on their right side than their left side. Some people using wheelchairs, unfortunately, had strokes uh, and it affects their, their right side, but their left side is okay. You, you're right, there's no, there's no perfect location, 
Um, and all I can say is we keep looking at vehicle design to make sure it's appropriate. Again, it's something that, that we're looking at. But I think there's no ideal answer because everybody's different. And, and some people will find the positioning by the window easier. Some people find the positioning in the middle easier. I think it's all about understanding and empathy. I'm afraid we've had time only for yeah, one, one more, more question. Yeah. Right, yeah, one, two. Right, um, I've got a suggestion. When the wheelchair is pressed, you've got closed circuit TV monitoring on buses, haven't you? Yes. Why don't you have it so when that wheelchair button's pressed, so the driver can actually see who's pressed the bell? The, well, the issue, the issue there would be if the driver's driving, you wouldn't know the bell had been pressed until it's been pressed. So I, I take your point. The, the point there is, for me, it's about communication because you're, the driver's only going to be aware the bell's pressed after it's been pressed, if that makes sense. Because up until that point, their, their eyes are going to be on the road, and that's where I'd want them to be. Mm -hmm. I, I, if they're driving the bus, they've really got to be focusing on what's happening outside the bus. I think it's about communication. It's a fair point you raise, but for me, it's about communication. As I said to the lady, my my view would be, and, and what we've offered to drivers as part of the training, is speak to the person. Um, would you like to get off here? Some drivers will actually ask a uh, wheelchair user when they board, where are you travelling to? So they'll know in advance where that person's going to. The, the problem that with your suggestion, albeit a good one, is that you wouldn't know who's pressed it at the time, because you'll be focusing on the road. You'll just know somebody's pressed it. And for me, you turn around and say, is this your stop? Is this the stop that you wanted? Um, and then the wheelchair user can either say yes or no and, and take it from there. So for me, it's all about communication and empathy, definitely. But thank you for your, for your question. I think that's about it now, folks. Um, we're going to close the, the event very, very shortly. So thank you for your time. Thank you for coming along to the event. Um, before you go, there are still boards uh, with post-it notes on. If you've got any final comments you'd like to, to post for us, um, but as I said to many people earlier, for me this isn't the end, this is the beginning um, and I hope it's the first of many similar events uh, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much.